Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Environmental Technology News Server. This is a, a weekly program on environment technology. Namaste, Savarikra. Welcome, welcome to the, the first episode. We are on the 5th April, as I mentioned, this is a program on every Tuesday starting from today. Every week on Tuesday, we are we're going to organize this weekly program on the environment technology. And this is managed and owned by Technobase. Let me give you brief info about the uh, environmental technology news server, what it means. Okay, this is a new server, what kind of information is in there. Uh, let me show you a short uh, presentation as a video, okay, and uh, you can understand uh, briefly about what it is about. That's uh, briefly about environment technology news server. I'm hoping that you get some idea about what is the content of this environmental technology news server. We will not have all the components in one episode. We will be addressing each episode in a couple of things, uh, whether it is wastewater, air pollution, whether it is biogas or bio biomasses. So we will be dividing the component components of uh, various issues related to the environment technology in various episodes. So that's uh, what I give you the broad picture of the environmental technology in use server. Let me um, briefly introduce to you about Technobase. You know, probably you may not heard about Technobase before. Yeah, you heard about it briefly or you know already a lot. So for the un better understanding to all the audience, um, let me give you some intro. It's a basically a resource center for the industries and technologies. And as you know, we cover and they focus on the education and the business and the networking. These are the three pillars of the technology's activity. We offer a global services. We organize exhibitions. We organize trainings, conferences, webinars, business networks, we have publications. We also have a talent search, knowledge testing and also technical consulting. And also we offer companies who are looking for assistance, integrated marketing, and a new thing is a new server. So this is a, a broadly the service, uh, what kind of services we offer. When it comes to the business focus, uh, we have a, a two, two major segments. We call it one is on the polymer industry, other one is on the technology side. You know, uh, with yeah, technology is a chemical, and also energy, environment, water, membrane, filtration, separation, and also cover on advanced materials as well. In terms of polymers, we cover on like rubber industry, plastics, polyurethane, and also adhesive. So, well, there's a broad spectrum of uh, our business focus. So, this, yeah, this is what is all about the about the technologies. Okay, well, you can always reach out to me if you need more assistance you know, about the technologies. Uh, let's look into the what are the highlights what can I mean this episode today first we will have a presentation on the abatement technologies and uh, techniques for industrial process emissions by Richard Grishinka from Engel environmental systems after that we have a presentation on the renewable energy sustainable biomass supply chain and energy by Kalanam Rohit Dev from Punjab renewable energy systems after that, we have author talk, uh, 
is the, the author of the book Wastewater Treatment Technologies Design Concentration, Dr. Mutin Jai Chabay. We'll be discussing with him about his book and also some of the issues on the wastewater technologies. Okay, let's get into the, the session, today's episode, the Environment Technology News Hour. First, as I mentioned to you, the first topic is abatement technologies and techniques for industrial process emissions. Let me brief you about um, our speaker, Mr. Richard Reishka, as the Vice President of the Angular Environmental Systems. Since 1982, he has been involved in the technical sales, application engineering, and product development of air pollution control equipment for various industrial applications. Before joining Angular in 2001 as Vice President of Business Development, he was the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for RICO Research Cottrell and the Regional Vice President for Smith Engineering. He has authored numerous technical articles and white papers. In addition, Mr. Grajnika has served as a member of several industrial associations, presented numerous times on various air pollution control topics. As you see, he has a uh, Angle Environmental has over 40 years experience supplying the air pollution control equipment for VOC, HAP, odor, and particular, particular emission abatement. This includes the direct flow, fire, catalytic, recuperative, and regenerative thermal oxidizer, cyclones, concentrator systems, acid, gas, scrubbers, and other air, air filtration systems. As you see, Mr. Richard Grishinka has extensive experience in the uh, air pollution systems and technologies. I believe that this presentation is very useful to all of us. Let's welcome um, Sir Richard to come on board and make a presentation, please. Thank you, Pram. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening. I uh, appreciate uh, everyone taking the time to listen to our presentation. Uh, that was a very good overview. So I will, uh, I'll just step right through it. So uh, I'm here with again with Angle Environmental to discuss uh, thermal oxidation, uh, thermal oxidizer equipment components and capabilities for air pollution control in industrial process emissions. Uh, we'll cover briefly uh, some emission definitions, uh, spend most of our time on the various oxidation technology overviews, uh, how to select equipment, which equipment is, is available on the market these days, uh, and uh, a little bit of time on efficiency enhancements. Uh, operating cost and fuel usage is a major uh, concern for everybody in the world today. So we'll focus on that a bit, and then we'll leave some time at the end for uh, questions and discussion if appropriate. Uh, just a brief background to expand a bit on uh, Angle Environmental. Uh, Angle is a US-based company started in 1978 by Gene Engel, uh, based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We've grown to uh, over uh, 90 million uh, US dollars in sales per year, uh, with over 200 employees around the world, five primary global locations and, and others as well, secondary locations. And we've installed uh, over 2,200 uh, pieces of equipment around the world in the past 40 odd years. Uh, we focus again on air solutions, air pollution emissions. Uh, we do have uh, a water division as well that handles uh, water emissions. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, running everything as efficiently as possible and being cost conscious with energy recovery solutions is also part of our, our mandate. So today we're here to uh, talk about uh, air pollution emissions and we're focusing on gaseous or vapor emissions. Uh, typically, those are volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, as they're known. Um, uh, we do get involved with particulate emissions as well from, from the burning of fossil fuels and, and that sort of thing, but, but this presentation is, is focused primarily on the gaseous side, the, the VOCs. And of course, um, in certain parts of the world, some of those uh, volatiles are also classified as hazardous air pollutants. Uh, they can cause... Uh, cancer or uh, health issues if if uh, ingested into the body in, in reasonable quantities. And then when they're emitted to the atmosphere, uh, they also do damage to the environment. So most uh, regulatory agencies around the world 
uh, have some sort of governmental regulation on the amount of emissions you can emit to the atmosphere. And that's what uh, what what pretty much drives our business. The reason uh, the, these governmental agencies are concerned about uh, the VOC and HAP emissions from industrial processes, sometimes they're called uh, stationary processes, but they're also similar to the uh, to the normal uh, what what everyone's familiar with. If you look out in the world and, and you see what we call smog or uh, or or low level ozone uh, in in industrial in in built up areas, city areas. What ends up happening is the uh, the volatile organic compounds uh, and sometimes the NOx emissions, nitrogen oxides, will rot will will be emitted at ground level, and as they rise in the environment, uh, sunlight interacts with them and they form what we call it the ground level ozone. Uh, that in and of itself can cause uh, areas of a population center that has got just poor air quality, uh, which over time as I mentioned, will impact the, the quality of life and the, the health of the, the residents that, are, that live in that area. So usually it's a government regulatory uh, concern that, that has a guide over the amount of material that can be emitted. Usually it's a mass kilograms per hour, pounds per hour of, uh, of the molecular st st structures of the compounds that are being regulated. Once it's determined that your industrial process has an emission of uh, a given compound, uh, typical ones you might be familiar with would be things like toluene or methyl ethyl ketone, glues, resins, paint vapors, plastics, anything coming off of a process like that. Uh, our mission in thermal oxidation is to capture those fumes, uh, bring them into a thermal oxidizer, uh, add heat, and the presence of oxygen and uh, essentially break apart those molecular compounds and forming CO2 and H2O or, or water vapor and usually some excess heat. Uh, that process is the thermal oxidation process. Uh, it varies dramatically depending on the quantity of uh, vapors that are coming to an oxidizer as to whether it is an exothermic reaction where once this this uh, heat is added and the oxidation occurs. A lot of times, uh, the reaction can be can be very dramatic and a lot of lot of energy. Uh, much heat can be released, or in certain locations and applications, when you might have very low concentrations of a particular compound that that may be uh, more dangerous than than most, maybe a formaldehyde or a um, uh, hydrogen cyanide, something like that, which is extremely poisonous even at low levels. Uh, when you do this oxidation process, it could require more energy added to the process to get the oxidation than a release of energy from a higher concentration stream. So that that difference really impacts the type of thermal oxidizer you want to choose. And Angle offers a full range of, of the various technologies that are available in the marketplace. But we'll touch a little bit on each one. This is an overview. And uh, in order of um, acceptability or uh, um, uh, usage in the industry, uh, currently the regenerative thermal oxidizers, the RTOs on the upper left-hand side there, are are a tech is a technology that's probably the most commonplace and the, and used uh, the most frequently. However, there are a, a number of other technologies on the upper right-hand side. You can see a direct-fired thermal oxidizer or DFTO. Those are also extremely popular for uh, applications where you've got higher concentrations. So the RTO tends to be very energy efficient and handles therefore moderate to low levels of concentration in an efficient way, whereas the direct fired thermal oxidizer can handle uh, much higher concentrations uh, when energy usage is not as critical. And then there's there's a number of other technologies that that fill that fill out the list. Thermal recuperative oxidizers, which use a, a metallic heat exchanger, uh, catalytic recuperative oxidizers, which have a number of advantages the catalytic design does. Uh, emission concentrators are here. We show at the bottom in the middle, uh, that's a, a zeolite or carbon concentration, again, for extremely low um, concentration streams. 
and then a vapor combustor technology, which is uh, an enclosed flare type design. So we'll touch on each one of these a little bit to explain uh, why you would choose one over the other. But before we get into the specific technologies, the application of these technologies is quite broad. Um, the, the number of applications or industrial processes that, that use thermal oxidizers is quite extensive. Everything from, uh, I'll touch on a few here, you know, automotive, uh, in particular, the painting operations of vehicles, um, carbon fiber manufacturing, chemical processing of, of all types, uh, coating and laminating. Um, the list goes on. There's some spe specialized uh, applications like uh, ethylene oxide sterilization. But we see an awful lot around the world in, in traditional industries like film and flexographic printing. Um, metal decorating or can manufacturing is, is very uh, active and, and, uh, and uh, in, involved right now. Of course, petroleum refining, natural gas processing, pharmaceuticals, plastics, uh, semiconductors is a big, uh, big market for us right now, uh, web coating, and then the production of wood, pulp, and paper as well. So, so we, we get involved in, in many different industries and in many different quadrants of the world. Uh, stepping through the technologies here a little bit, uh, these are just rules of thumb or guidelines. They're not uh, hard and fast uh, um, requirements for the technology, but the direct fired thermal oxidizer DFTO is probably the most straightforward. Uh, basically, it's a it's a insulated uh, tube uh, that um, has a burner on the system here, a natural gas fired burner typically. Uh, processed gas is, is presented to the oxidation chamber. Fuel is added for heat. Oxygen is added if need be or, process, or uh, in the form of, uh, of uh, just additional ambient air. And then as it pulls through the uh, pulls through or pushes through the oxidation chamber, uh, the, the temperature is raised. Uh, a residence time is required to to uh, get the reaction. So we 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 mentioned uh, the time, turbulence, and temperature that were presented on the previous screen. You want to have enough time with the oxygen and mix it properly at the proper temperature to form that thermal uh, oxidation process that we mentioned. Uh, the two big differences here, are oftentimes these applications, as I mentioned, have cases where the, the heat value or the energy value of the process stream is very high, sometimes uh, so high that it would be in an explosive range if not inerted. Uh, we see these, these DFTOs applied to applications where you might have a nitrogen blanketed stream off a chemical reactor, for example, and the addition of the oxygen occurs in the oxidizer itself. So that's a typical application here for, for this one. Again, it's the more simpler uh, technology from a, from a design standpoint. However, it also handles the uh, more energy intensive emission stream typically. An offtake on the DFTO is a, is a device we call a vapor combustor unit. Um, this is oftentimes used as a, you could also uh, classify it as an enclosed flare possibly. Same basic idea, uh, uh, retention chamber that's enclosed, uh, combustion air at the bottom, fan system, and a reaction takes place in the, in the tube uh, and then react, it emits the atmosphere. Um, Again, typically used for applications where you've got higher concentrations and uh, therefore the destruction efficiency, uh, the completion of the thermal oxidation can actually be quite high um, for these vapor combustors. Adding one level of complexity would be the uh, thermal recuperative oxidizer. Uh, this is a uh, schematic representation where you might have a burner down in this hot end of the oxidizer and this represents a metallic heat exchanger. The idea is the processed gas is, uh, is pushed through the heat exchanger, raises its temperature closer to the oxidation temperature. The burner comes on, oxidation occurs, and before that air is emitted to the atmosphere, it goes through the same heat exchanger on the opposite side, and it uses, therefore uses the, the heat of oxidation in the thermal oxidizer to preheat the processed gas coming in from the process, therefore reducing the amount of fuel that's required in the in the combustion process. Uh, typically, these metallic heat exchangers 
would be in the 50 to 70 percent energy efficient range. Um, otherwise, they just get too big and, and too too costly to provide. But uh, it does a nice job of reducing um, fuel usage by using that preheat mechanism. Still, you're looking at, at gas streams that would be somewhat on the higher range of uh, energy uh, availability so that you could utilize uh, some of that uh, heat of combustion um, as the VOCs are oxidized to, to reduce fuel consumption further. Um, one thing that does happen with these type of designs is that because the efficiency of the heat exchanger, thermal efficiency, is only in the 50 to 70 percent range, and if we're oxidizing at, uh, say, 800 degrees C down here or maybe 1500 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with a 50 or 60 70 percent heat recovery you still have some fairly warm temperatures coming out the stack which allow themselves um, to be used for secondary heating needs sometimes for heat recovery for a process for, for example that may need uh, additional heat uh, the catalytic thermal oxidizer is a little bit different um, this was very popular uh, in the early days of thermal oxidation for air pollution control in the 1980s 1990s um, uh, it's still used quite a bit today for specific process applications. Um, the difference with the, th with the catalytic oxidizer is we insert a usually precious metal catalyst, uh, sometimes base metal catalyst, in the oxidizer itself. What that does is it uh, allows the VOCs when they cross the catalyst to, uh, to sort of uh, begin the, the, the reaction uh, at lower temperature. So because the catalyst is present, it forms a, a molecular um, uh, uh, pull on the bonds. Uh, you can get uh, thermal oxidation usually at about 50% of the temperature you would normally need. So uh, it lowers the fuel consumption further. Uh, we still, in this case here, we still show a preheat heat exchanger where the process gas would come in, raises temperature uh, to some level, a pre-filter here, then catalyze in the catalyst and then use the same heat through the heat exchanger before going up to atmosphere. Um, it, it, as I mentioned, it, it reduces the fuel usage requirements. Uh, these catalysts um, are, are somewhat sensitive, however, to particulate. That's why we show here a, a pre-filter in front of the catalyst. Any dust or inorganic material can tend to foul or plug a catalyst. And sometimes, depending on, again on the, on the application, uh, you could have a chemical reaction and deactivate the catalyst as well. So uh, you usually want to design the system for very specific cases where it, uh, we know that it's a catalyst-friendly environment. Again, in years, years, years ago, this was very um, popular because the temperature was lower uh, than a th normal thermal oxidizer and the capital cost wasn't so bad or so high. Um, but it did require periodic testing and potentially replacement or cleaning of that catalyst. The regenerative thermal oxidizer or the RTO is the technology that's sort of taken over some of those other technologies we mentioned before. Uh, and as this acceptance of this technology has increased over the years, the capital cost has come down quite a bit. So what used to be capital cost prohibitive in years before is now quite um, quite acceptable, and uh, essentially these design these designs are for a relatively small uh, thousand cfm to a hundred thousand scfm or about a hundred and ten thousand normal meters cubed of volume. Uh, the idea here is that they use a, a ceramic style heat exchanger in beds. Uh, this schematic shows a two bed oxidizer, uh, and you would take the process gas. It would raise its temperature through the through the ceramic bed, oxidizer the burner if need be, and deposit its heat on the outlet bed. Uh, you can get a thermal efficiency of between 95 and 97 percent in this particular uh, design, so it dramatically reduces the fuel usage that's required. Uh, this shows, again, a two-chamber RTO or two-canister RTO, which is typically popular here in North America. And then there's also things called multi-chamber, three-chamber, five-chamber uh, RTO designs which allow uh, for a, a third chamber to be purged before you switch from one chamber to the other for the preheating mechanism. And it gets you a, a slightly higher destruction efficiency 
which is sometimes required depending on the regulatory agents and the requirements in various countries. Oftentimes, the three chamber is very popular in Europe, for example, and some parts of Asia as well. And the objective is uh, in order to select the proper oxidizer, we would want to look at uh, various uh, conditions with your VOC loading. Sometimes they vary across uh, across an application. Sometimes they're fixed. And looking at the uh, the fuel cost per hour based on the, the price of energy that you're paying in your location, and you look at the two different or three different uh, different styles of oxidizers and where your application fits. And this is an example where you can see an RTO for, for these criteria here shows quite a lower uh, fuel usage than, than the other uh, technology, the DFTO in this comparison. So that, that's what one thing we do is a lot of times help clients decide which is the, the, the most important criteria for their case. Uh, once the systems are in and running, a lot of these are installed already. The regulations have been in place around the world for, for decades now. So there's oftentimes a cases where you might have an older piece of equipment uh, that's not optimized to current standards. And, and some of these rules here also apply to new equipment. Uh, make the right choice of the technology that you pick. Uh, know what your, your estimated and, and actual oxidizer operating costs are if they're running. Um, look at the, the, the performance percentages as time goes by, uh, monitoring your process, you know, know whether your emission levels are continuous or varying over time, how many hours a year do you operate, you know, what is your shutdown strategy, that kind of thing. Um, that helps us all determine what type of oxidizer we need and how thermally efficient it needs to be designed. Typically, the more thermally efficient, the higher the capital cost. Um, Again, obviously, there's there's a uh, need to pay attention to the federal or, or state regulations, both on emission standards, but also on fuel usage. Oftentimes, in today's world, if you can reduce the amount of fuel used, reduce the amount of carbon footprint in a plant, sometimes there's a uh, there's uh, money is available to uh, to initiate that type of activity. Um, one thing we touched on earlier that we didn't spend a lot of time on, which is worth mentioning here is this concentrator system. Uh, this little schematic shows a rotor concentrator upstream of a, an RTO uh, put together as a package system. This would be for an application where you might have a uh, very high volume of, of gas emissions, let's say, but very low concentration. By going through a concentrator, it basically uh, absorbs the VOCs onto a zeolite material and then desorbs a lower volume at higher concentration to go to a smaller thermal oxidizer. Uh, keeps your fuel usage down, uh, keeps your carbon footprint down. Um, it's a nice nice technology and being used more and more these days. Uh, the one thing that you have to be careful of, similar to a, a catalyst, the, um, the zeolite material in the rotor concentrator can be susceptible to particulate, to fouling, to plugging. Um, it's also limited to its effectiveness to temperatures that are usually below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees C, and in concentrations that are about 500 parts per million or lower of the volatile organic compound. The, uh, again, regardless of what style of oxidizer you choose, there's usually a, a ga natural gas-fired burner or LPG burner, uh, propane, Sometimes you can you, we use electric uh, heating systems as well, but more often than not, it's a it's a gas fired system or oil fired system. Um, knowing where that air for combustion comes from uh, can can reduce your operating cost uh, considerably. So uh, oftentimes we'll work with the process supplier, process equipment supplier, the emission equipment, and look at uh, whether or not we want to use uh, or can use. Uh, some of that process air for combustion air, for example. Uh, and then there's the idea of uh, improving the primary heat recovery, whether it's a, uh, a, a metallic style heat exchanger like a coil shown on the left there, uh, added to a system or on the regenerative thermal oxidizer, the RTO, there are a number of different styles of, of ceramic heat exchangers, whether they be a loose random pack like are shown here uh, that are put into a chamber or more like a structural block uh, design. Uh, again, there's, there's positives and negatives to both design. 
Uh, these should be taken into consider if you're looking at a new system, certainly. And then if you're um, if you're also uh, looking at a retrofit of an existing system, there's been a lot of advancements uh, recently in these technologies that can be applied. Um, the object of these uh, systems is to reduce the fuel usage in the oxidizer itself. Uh, another approach is to consider what we call secondary heat recovery. I alluded it alluded to it earlier a little bit. If your process emission stream is uh, is is high and you have a big heat release, depending on the energy recovery you use, you may have excess heat coming out the stack of the oxidizer. Uh, putting in a, uh, a heat recovery system for secondary heat is very popular. Uh, usually, if there's a process inside the facility that requires heat, be it hot water or steam, um, these, these technologies often um, can, can reduce your processing cost as well. So in addition to cleaning the air emissions and satisfying the regulations for the environment, you could also reduce the energy usage, the carbon footprint of your process uh, as well. And then the, the maintenance of equipment is obviously critical. Um, all of our machines are typically run by, by PLC-based controllers. Uh, tuning and keeping everything uh, operational is, uh, is, is important to make sure every, uh, the process is in balance and we're not uh, using more energy or, or ineffectively capturing the fumes uh, on an ongoing basis. And just some photographs here to give uh, an example. Uh, this, this shows a direct fired thermal oxidizer with uh, an acid gas scrubber on the back end. So here's your, your oxidizers in the horizontal position, a quench on the vertical and a scrubber going down. Uh, oftentimes in an oil refining application, for example, here that we're showing, if you're oxidizing sulfuric compounds, uh, you'll, you'll form sulfuric acid in the oxidation process. So an acid gas scrubber sometimes is required, not often, or, or not typically, I should say, but uh, depending on the application, if you've got sulfurs or halogenated streams coming from your process, post-oxidizer scrubbing uh, is, a, is a concern. Uh, this, this picture shows a very large catalytic oxidizer uh, from a chemical plant, uh, PTA production. Uh, again, this catalyst proves itself to be very effective with that particular uh, chemistry and works very well. When you're talking about volumes uh, this large, you know, 120,000 normal meters cubed, 80,000 SCFM, uh, keeping your, your operating costs down is, uh, is, is critical and the catalyst did a nice job on, on this installation. Uh, this, this is a double uh, system here that shows a regenerative thermal oxidizer on the right-hand side, an RTO, and then a concentrator system uh, up on the left-hand side here. Uh, the idea is that, uh, again, the, the process gas at a higher volume, 40,000 SCFM, enters the rotor concentrator and is then concentrated down to a lesser volume going to the oxidizer, 5,000 SCFM going to the RTO. So this shows a good example of how the combined technology can, can reduce your operating cost. Uh, an alternative to this basically is, uh, is a simple, relatively simple RTO. In this case, it's a, it's a 50,000 CFM uh, case. So this would be a situation where you take that volume of, of emit process emissions that go directly to a, a larger RTO without a concentrator in place. Um, this might be applicable for cases that are not friendly to the concentrator. If it's a higher temperature, particulate, higher moisture, as we mentioned, uh, you know, the RTO has really sort of handled a lot of um, uh, we'll call uh, problematic streams that maybe have particulate or, uh, or other uh, compounds that can, that can cause damage to a concentrator or a catalyst. The RTOs are more robust, can handle more. They still require maintenance, and every once in a while you find an application that might require the ceramic beds to be upgraded or cleaned, um, but as a general rule, the RTO has become sort of the workhorse of the industry uh, now. For additional resources, uh, you can follow the links here, um, and uh, our website is uh, broken down to applications and technology, so you can step through if you'd like. But um, that 
that concludes our, our overview. Um, I'm available to, uh, to chat here or when the other presentations are finished. And I uh, thank you again for your time and attention and look forward to, uh, to maybe talking to you in the future. Thank you, Richard. Uh, excellent presentation on the thermal oxidizers. Um, you know, let's have a couple of um, questions uh, for the benefit of the audience. And uh, audience, you can also pose any questions you have um, because this is a live session. So I'm happy to ask any questions um, you have on this topic. If you're watching on YouTube later on, uh, you can also post your comments on the, under the YouTube as well. Okay, the, so that we can reach out to Richard to comment on those uh, remarks you have. Uh, Richard, you, it's really interesting to know about RTO is really, uh, I think, the, the major force in, in taking care of the emissions, industry emissions. Um, you know, and based on your experience, a long experience, which industry is a major producer of UOCs in terms of concentration? In terms of concentration, I would say you're looking at mostly the chemical processing industry, um, where you've got small, relatively small volumes, but but concentrated uh, emission sources. So um, those are probably offset by, let's say, automotive painting or painting in general or coating. Mm -hmm. There you've got much lower concentrations, but much much higher volumes of air. So it really depends on on what your uh, what the you know what what your plant is manufacturing what the process is because what uh, the, the trickiest one is when you've got both right <laughs> and sometimes you do a high concentration in one stream and then a low concentration high volume in the other stream yeah. um, so so we really we really try and differentiate that and get to know uh, the process and some of the processes are variable you know some are, are high loading at first and then they tail off later yeah. on so. So understanding the process emission is really critical to selecting the right piece of equipment. You know, the angle is support I mean the kind of doing business globally, right? And so if the same same line of production line as in the process, um, did you see any difference in terms of the, the concentration of UOCs as a chemical plant in, in USA or in Asia or in Europe? Are the same similar? No, I, I would say the, the emission streams are very similar. We oftentimes focus on industry uh, niches, for example, carbon fiber manufacturing, automotive painting, uh, can production. You know, all these types of industries are usually similar across the world, especially the way things are nowadays. This, this call in particular where, we're, where there's people all over the world on it um, sharing information so that the applications will be consistent across the industry or across the world. What's different sometimes is the regula regulations. For example, yeah. in the USA, the emission levels are, are based on an hourly average, and there's a percent reduction you have to have of the mass of VOC you emit. In Europe, for example, they'll have a, uh, a kilogram per normal meter cubed or a specific number that is, uh, that's not an average. It has to be met all the time. So that's why the three-chamber RTO, which is more efficient, is applied almost exclusively, not not exclusive, but almost exclusively in Europe, and the two-chamber RTO, which is which is slightly less efficient, uh, de destruction efficiency-wise, but on average very close. That's much more popular here in the U.S. because the regulatory environment is different. And then and then you always have the multinational companies that have installations in Asia, Europe, uh, Europe, and, and they make their own, they make their own rules. So some of them say, listen, we're doing it this way everywhere. And it's as simple as that. Uh, yeah. Where, you, where so it gets to be interesting is when you find a local company in a, in a marketplace that doesn't have a strong regulation, what do they do? That's always, there's a, there's a, there's a decision process there as well. I think the emissions sort of, uh, quality or characteristics are similar, but it's down to the regulatory, you know, standards exactly. in there. Yeah. Right. Uh, is there any requirement on the, you know, before you get into the, the oxidizer, do you need to do any pretreatment or anything to taken care of, you know, for the? Uh, sometimes, yeah. If it's uh, again, they, these are all depending which oxidizer technology you use. Some of them are susceptible to particulate. Um, to uh, to moisture if it's excessive moisture, um, so sometimes a pre-filter is required. Not always though. Again, uh, depending on on the application, uh, and that's part of our evaluation. Uh, 
the, every once in a while, I mean, sometimes you have to have a very aggressive pre-filter if it's something that's really difficult to deal with, but those are usually the exception. Uh, we, we try and apply the RTO and design the media selection for uh, to be tolerant of particulate, for example, um, to a, a moderate degree. And what kind of operational you know, troubles you can expect in, in operating these oxidizers? You know, you have various types of oxidizers. Well, the, 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 the trick is, I guess, focusing on the moving parts. Uh, they all have a burner or heat device of some type. They all have uh, fans, uh, motors. Uh, usually there's flow control valves involved, especially on the RTO. So keeping the maintenance, uh, again, it's relatively uh, low level maintenance, fans, burners, valves, dampers, but keeping them lubricated and, and uh, working properly is critical. If they are not maintained, you'll get a simple failure uh, in, a, in a flow control valve, for example, could allow the heat to build up in the oxidizer and then shut it down. And, and oftentimes, uh, the regulatory environment in the countries will say if your abatement equipment is shut off or, or fails, your process has to stop. So that impacts production in these ma in manufacturing plants. So that's critical. Uh, so maintaining maintenance, sometimes providing redundant fans in critical locations is something a lot of customers look at. Um, so yeah, so maintaining relatively simple maintenance items, but if they're not maintained properly, they can cause big problems. So yeah, you know, I think that even okay, if you look at the uh, regular, we go back to the regulatory standards. Of course, Europe and US have a kind of benchmark for the other parts of the world, but is also Asia also. I think they're improving their standards and in, in the kind of uh, dealing with all the pollutants. How is your experience? You're also doing a business in Asia as well, is it? I'm so serving Asian countries, various companies. Uh, how do you see the the progress on the in this air pollution in Asia for you? Yeah, it's funny, but the uh, the implementation of regulations has followed pretty much the industrialization of countries. For example, 20 years ago, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea were the biggest uh, innovators and required our systems. Uh, nowadays, we do a huge business in China, in Taiwan. Um, we sell equipment in Thailand, Malaysia, Australia, India. We've got installations in India now. Uh, so it's sort of moved forward now so that the, you know, I would consider the developed countries, more developed countries like, like I said, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea to be an established market almost as secure and mature as Europe or North America. And then uh, China is becoming that way quickly. India is following that suit. And then the uh, the other ASEAN companies or countries are are to different degrees catching up. So uh, it's 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 not the way it used to be where you you move to Asia and there was no regulations. That's that's changing. So uh, yeah. that's good. We we think that's good for the world. We're happy to see that um, and uh, happy to and, and because of that we've moved. We have offices in 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 different places of the world: China and Taiwan and Thailand, etc. India. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's following the the, the develop, industrialization of the of the world really. What happens if the customer decides to change the fuel? You know. Um, well, again, if it's if it stays on a natural gas, propane, LNG, that's relatively minor adjustments. Switching to a, a oil, as long as it's a you know a diesel or a, a fuel grade number two, that's that's not that difficult. Where we do get into issues is where people want to use, you know, uh, number six oils or or waste oils or things like that, and then then you get a little bit more more tricky. Uh, and then of course there's the possibility of using electric heat, which there's a lot of interest in right now because of the carbon footprint advantages. Yeah. Uh, however, th those really high temperatures with an electric element is is can be problematic as well. So. Um, yeah, if, if you so if it stays through the with a gas-based fuel system, it's pretty easy to do. Liquid-based fuel system more difficult, and you're switching to electric. You got to reevaluate your system a little bit. Thanks, Richard. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing your in, insights and various issues that I raised. Appreciate your time today. Um, uh, thank you very much, and I also convey my sincere thanks to Kevin for coordinating this uh, you know session with uh, Richard today. Okay, guys, if you have more questions on this subject, on this topic, you know how to reach to the uh, Richard. Okay, thank you all.
Thank you, Prath. Let's, okay, let's move to the, the next uh, part of the session. Um, before I invite uh, the uh, next speaker, I would like to introduce about the, you know, our Technobiz organizers uh, training programs. I will show you a quick uh, presentation on the membrane technology online training programs that we offer. Let's just have a quick look on the uh, membrane technology training programs that we are offering. Okay, that's uh, those are the training programs that we have on the membrane technology. If you're interested in the membrane technology, uh, you can visit our website knowhow-webinars.com. They are available as on schedule as well as on demand as well. So please check it out. Okay, now move to the next uh, presentation. It's on the renewable energy, renewable energy, sustainable biomass supply chain and energy. This presentation will be given by Colonel Rohit Dev. He is a Chief Operating Officer at the Punjab Renewable Energy Systems, a private limited, uh, shortly called PRESPL, uh, based in India. Uh, let me briefly introduce about um, Mr. Rohit Dev. He is a young dynamic leader who moved from the armed forces after an illustrious career in uh, November 2018 and joined the Punjab renewable energy systems as a COO 
Yeah. And in his military career of uh, 24 years, he has been at the top of the you know, profession, held all prestigious appointments, had a detailed insight in the operational logistics and the supply chain management of a strategic field organization in the Northern Command. A defense expert is a graduate from the National Defense Academy. He also holds a master's in uh, operational art and strategic thinking. And he is an invited speaker and been a leadership panel discussion on many prestigious uh, topics related to the biomass supply chain management and bio, bioenergy sector in India and also in the global summits. He's also a, a prolific writer and orator and also every television personality in Indian media as a defense analyst and a geopolitical security expert. So let's welcome uh, Mr. Rohit Dev uh, to give a presentation on the Renewable energy, sustainable biomass supply chain and energy. Let me ask him to share his screen. Good evening in India here and uh, mature part greetings of the day. Uh, as introduced, I am the CEO of one of the niche and a lead a bioenergy company in India today, Punjab Renewables Energy Systems. And uh, we have come a long way in the last one decade. Uh, this company incidentally has been, you know, nourished, raised and taken ahead by one singular man, uh, Colonel Monish Ahuja, who due to his limitations of travel could not be here today. And he has uh, been the man who actually thought 10 years ago nearly that biomass supply chain is going to be crit critical for every bioenergy project in India and across the world. Uh, having said that, I will just, uh, you know, we have already overshot a little bit of time to cover that as well. I will take you through a presentation and just give my views initially, and then I'll be happy to take on questions uh, both uh, from Mr. Rao and the audience as well. Uh, if you go to the global energy scan, uh, we find uh, that in the next nearly about 20 years or so, uh, there's going to be a quantum jump uh, in the use of renewables. So if you see the graphics on the left, and you also see the surge on the right, uh, it's uh, enough to say that all forms of renewable energy uh, which achieve net zero or otherwise are going to be most critical for every developing nation, every developed nation, and every aspiring nation as well. So I think the world is changing. And the dependency on fossil fuel and coal and other elements which we extract from earth are going to go away and we have seen a transition in the last decade or so uh, in the solar part and how india has taken the lead in the international solar alliance uh, i believe the next energy transition is also shaping from our country and it will be in the bioenergy space uh, which rejuvenates the rural sector as well if you go on to see the global uh, projections and you find there are two uh, main headings I want you to look at is the surge in the bioenergy segment and also the renewables part. And this is something which is going to grow exponentially. This is giving a world parameter. But I believe India in this particular domain uh, will lead the world. In so far as the consumption and, and renewable energy share is concerned, Three parameters to note that you see the slide and the graphics on the right. Let me tell you the fossil fuel dependency world over it has to go down because that is a limited resource. It does not have the timelines of millions of years to create the same oil which we can splurge upon. Modern renewables in all segments, which mini hydro, whether it is solar, bioenergy based, idle based, it's all coming up. The wind-based technologies are all coming up and they are part of the bouquet of the modern renewable systems. And biofuels, like I say, whether it's for vehicles, uh, whether it's for public transportation, private transportation, and whether it is tomorrow for the sustainable aviation fuel part or the aviation sector, I think this is going to be the future ahead. And why I did mention about the aviation future is because the Corsia norms dictate that we have to make this change and abide by those norms are to be a more effective and more green. 
if we see the Indian energy sector before I go forward, if I just you know, uh, cover these two points on top, when the CA has estimated the share of renewable energy to substantially rise to up to 44%. So we are looking at a decade of growth of renewable energy systems in India. And we are also looking at commitments we have made in 2030. And also we are very well uh, you know, aware our Honorable Prime Minister has called for a net zero by 2070. These calls are based on the intent of our country uh, to take this ahead positively. And there are many steps being taken, but in terms of policy enunciation, if you see the National Hydrogen Energy Mission and also the National Biofuels Policy and more, uh, the intent is very clear, is to have this transition going through. In terms of consumption, our renewables is rising. It has risen in the last two decades very substantially. And also, if we see towards the scenarios which have been played up, uh, the renewables and also the traditional use of biomass are going to see a paradigm shift in the next two or three decades. In terms of investment, nearly an industry which will take in more than 80 billion US dollars in the next few years. So huge scope there as well. And, and mostly it's going to go to multiple segments of renewable energy, including uh, when we're talking about electric vehicles, those kind of technologies, battery power packs, storages, uh, hydrogen, and also biofuels. If you see the key investment which has happened during the pandemic per se and beyond, uh, the analysis shows that in India itself, uh, the investment has been upwards of about nearly now $10 billion uh, by the time we are speaking today. In terms of the bioenergy part and press spell, so let me give you a snapshot here. The energy demand, the bouquet is about 13% in renewables today in India. And most of it is going towards the bioenergy part. And most of that is going towards the you know, waste part, which is there in India. We also see the biomass generation potential in various types of biomass. And we have not even listed uh, you know, one third of it from the slide. But these are the major parameters of uh, counting are enough. And when we see the cost savings per year vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuel, we are looking at up to 30 to 40% of the savings there. In terms of CO2 mitigation, GHG you know, emissions being reduced, it's a carbon neutral fuel, so it helps with 100%. And energy savings in the terms of transition of energy to bioenergy based domain is about 10 to 15% on average, depending on which sector you are. If you just see the snapshot of the availability of biomass, so there is enough biomass available today in our country. And as we go into the future, on the left, you see various types of biomass, and this includes also the industrial waste, which could be groundnut waste, magas, and others. The uses of biomass are expanding. When we began with our you know, uh, company long time ago, we could see two or three of those major uses. But today, our company, and also worldwide, uh, we are looking at the transition of the utilization of this biomass, whether it's green hydrogen, biogas, biofuels, power generation, industrial applications for steam, heating, cooling, and electricity. Also, we find that there are enough small segments where Prespel has been encouraging entrepreneurs and itself taking on the mantle to grow these segments is the silage, which is the feed for dairy animals uh, for crematorium purpose, wherein you have on average, the Supreme Court of our country has pegged the value of a tree for one year at nearly 28,000, 27 something. And if you use two trees or five years vintage, you're looking at two and a half to three lakhs of money uh, being utilized in a cremation and that to illegal you know handling of the wood uh, when you compare that with the biomass based briquettes which we are using today in the country uh, the costs come down to traditionally about on average five thousand six thousand rupees uh, per uh, metric ton which is being used and about 300 400 tons being used there i think uh, it's a very good fuel uh, for for a process to change we are using that in furniture whether you see ikea or any other global player today even in india they are using biomass for that. Hotel and, and restaurants have got a tremendous use. Even segments like the tea states, when, when Europe is looking at green fuel-based tea industry, so obviously we have to change from the heating, which we utilize for the weathering process through kerosene. We now have to use greener fuel, and that is where biomass is coming up, making utensils like crockery, cutlery, straws. You'll be surprised to know that coconut frond-based uh, uh, straws, which we use for drinking our beverages, are being today exported from India to you know the world, and and the last was the person whom I mentored is now selling uh, that commodity in Hyatt Dubai, particle boards for affordable housing, 
packaging, shoes and garments, there is no list which is ending without the use of this particular waste. If you see our company, uh, we have transitioned from 2011, so we completed our you know, 10 years, 11th entering now last month. And we have been invested by four investors, two being the financial investors responsibility, Zurich based impact fund, and also the SBI need fund, which is a G2G funding between government of UK and India, supported by FCDO from UK, and supported by SBI Capital Markets and SIDBI in India. We also have two strategic partners in Shell, who came to us in August 2019, and Mitsui, uh, which took on the mantle uh, to be with us in August 2021. So that is how we are growing. And 2021 onwards is the era, that's the end of 2021 onwards. We are very proactively looking at the compressed biogas, biofuels, and we will also look at the sustainable emission fuel in the future. Our presence is pan India, and we look at every kind of biomass possible in India on a pan India basis. A typical model that revolves around the farmer, it's up and spoke model, where the village level entrepreneurs are created by Preskill, and they go back to their community and energize them to be able to collect the biomass which is required and bring it to our collection centers. And from there, there are many ways in which we utilize this biomass today, whether in the boiler segment biofuel segment for the users which I have told to you in the previous slide. And our, our entire journey begins with putting the awareness into the minds of our farmers. And in our ecosystem, nearly 60% of our revenue uh, goes back to the farmers in this way. In the canvas of our operations, we do supply chain management of the biomass. We do bricketing and pelleting of the biomass. We densify it to ensure it's financially viable for uh, projects which are distance, long distance projects from the sourcing of the biomass. Uh, we do operation and maintenance of boilers. We also invest in the boiler. And we have a robust biomass assessment uh, you know, study team, which, which does a lot of study in India and also across the globe. Just to give you a snapshot of our supply chain so that you understand what it involves, this is typically how we go to uh, the paddy fields. Stubble burning has been a major problem in India, which we are trying to solve. Uh, but we are not yet there as a company, as an entity. We have our own equipment and we are able to collect uh, these particular commodities. This is what a typical awareness campaign looks like, how we go to the villages and educate them. On the right top hand side is a person who came to us in the previous year. And within a year, he has been able to buy not only a car, but two more tractors just by being the VLE in this business with us. These are typically our collection centers. These are our collection centers and also the projects where we are running oil and boilers. This is the kind of handling we do of the equipment. So any source, whether it comes on tractor or bullock carts or camels, is welcome to get us the biomass in the country. This is typically a bricketing plant, which I was alluding to. And this is the first of its kind paddy straw-based bricketing plant of India, which was inaugurated in 2020, which makes bricket out of paddy straw. This is another plant in Maharashtra. This is how the fuel stocking is done to cater for the industry. We have a very clear system of EHS which we follow in our particular operations. And we have a regular and routine check which we conduct to ensure that all the EHS norms and the ESG norms are taken care of. We follow acute global standards. Our shareholders are a guarantee that Prespel is doing the right thing. And through their encouragement and their support, we are able to refine our processes in this domain. We also do a lot of ash handling and the ash family goes into brick making and fertilizers and other uses. We are cognizant of the pollution control. All automated plants give us a real time information of the pollution index, and we are able to make sure that our operations are run within the norms. This is the project which was our first automated boot project in which we invested in the boiler in Roper in Punjab. It has gone through two years. It was commissioned four days before COVID pandemic was announced as a lockdown in our country. And till date, it has not suffered even a second of operations not running because of lack of supply chain. So I'm reiterating again and again for every such operation which we conduct, our supply chain is the major backbone which runs these operations. There are enough energy savings, as you can see in this boiler operations, nearly 22% is a saving which we accrue. Typically, a farmer earns upwards of 2,500 US dollars in a, in a straw-based uh, economy, 
where we are aggregating the biomass to curate our supply chains. The key impacts which we have today are as flat from the slide. I will not labor on it. You can take a screenshot. The person below on the right side is Colonel Monish Auja, so you can Google him as well. Financial benefits are huge. We have been awarded in 2020 the UN Sustainable Development Goal Award as well, and we are making a lot of progress. We are, the, in fact, one of the rare companies on the globe which has also signed the energy compact of the United Nations uh, you know, earlier this year. The key challenges which remain in the biomass supply chain management are in three categories. It is firstly contingent to the harvest season, which is narrow. If you see Punjab, 45 to 60 days. If you go to south of our country, two cycles of harvesting. Yes, in the eastern part, you have two to three seasons of harvesting. The weather conditions not only affect the machines and the performance, they also affect the quality of the biomass and, and the quantity of the biomass is also a consideration because there are enough ground losses uh, due to windage, handling and other parameters. We also have this being a very complex situation of the supply chain, the dependency on the harvest schedule, the farmer's inability to have that much of biomass are all accounting towards complexities which, which keep and keep rising, the warehousing problem, the storage problem, the other problems are also the financial nature in which the banks don't understand the working capital uh, cycle of this particular operation. So now they're understanding because of our interaction with them over the last three years. And now we are a little comfortable, but not all banks are forthcoming to understand this. We also introduced farm financing uh, loan uh, schemes through, through banks. And in that, the farmer has the advantage of getting paid first. And we take that money as a loan onto Prespel to be paid back to the bank with a little bit of interest uh, later. So we are developing a lot of things to do around the supply chain of biomass, but still the handle to get the right thing is you know, a challenge because of all the complexities involved and as you can see on the screen. Then we see you know, what kind of interventions we want. And I've only listed a few, but I will only highlight in my speech a few of them. The first is the financial part around it wherein a standard loan, which is today being taken by the industry and companies like Prespel and also farmers, is with, is with a very high cost of borrowing. That needs to go down, and that needs to go down to as less as 4 to 5%, so that you are able to make it much more viable in the rural segment to be able to do this business and carry the projects a little, a little far away from the biomass sourcing areas. We also have to allow exports of biomass because we have enough and we have enough potential. If you see the Argus index today as well, it is upwards of 170 US dollars in terms of biomass commodities. Also, we propose this hybrid projects for round the clock availability of even electricity. A solar biomass hybrid is the way to go. Special schemes can be made for plantation drives and there is too much of focus required because today, if you see any you know, country, especially India, there are too many ministries looking at various small components of the use end use of the biomass, and they are all pulling the policies towards their particular projects and their particular vision. So MOPNG is doing uh, the biofuel side, the industry ministry, commerce ministry is doing something else. So that way the attention is divided and we need to come under a single umbrella to get that going. Uh, I will not labor more on the financial aspects at the moment, but equity funding for bioenergy and also the aspect of looking at the credit uh, you know, ratings, because if you want entrepreneurship to develop, uh, even in India and globally, uh, credit rate ratings and such like phenomena have to take a backseat so that you can encourage people to grow in this sector because the volumes required for business in the biofuel segment and also industries is tremendous. Finally, but not towards the end, I would like to just talk about you know, how the agencies like NABARD, FCI, NAFED, which are basically agricultural-based, you know, uh, PSUs of our country can also help industry uh, with storage, how the state governments can help us with the land lease for a long term tenure. So these are the kind of things which the government interventions can help us and others are listed here. I would like to you know give it a little pause and just talk a little bit more about the supply chain before I go forward. Uh, this slide shows how uh, you know we have achieved a small mark in the industry for ourselves and we we'll continue to do more and more. Uh, that is uh, generally the end of what I wanted to say, but on this slide, uh, let me just recapitulate the supply chain part. Biomass supply chain remains the backbone and will be the backbone for all industries, either in the biofuel segment, 
or in the segment of industrial use where you are signing off steam purchase agreements, steam use, whether you are looking at even round the clock tomorrow in the future, you are looking at all those small segments which I alluded to earlier, which also includes things like crematoriums, uh, you know, eco stoves. Uh, by the way, our company also is now you know, going into the manufacturing sector where we are trying to make uh, stoves, which are cooking stoves based on biomass pellets and also looking at space heaters, which you can replace kerosene in those kero heaters, which you used to have earlier for warming of rooms and spaces uh, by the use of uh, biomass pellets. And we are taking this drive ahead, uh, not only to the community in the city street, but also uh, with the Indian military for their post in high altitude areas and other places. And the second part is uh, the viability of the funding is coming in and we need to make sure that there are enough SOPs available for this industry to grow without subsidies, because we have seen in the past that subsidies have destroyed. And one last parting shot uh, as my personal intervention. Uh, we all are aware of the triple P model, which we follow globally. There is a model of the four P, the fourth P, in fact, the first P there in the four P's is the people, which is the farmer. And my consideration is that if you make a project, hypothetically, a compressed gas, a biogas project, and we peg it to a particular you know, a currency to sell uh, to sell that biomass or the biogas. I think from the profit which you accrue there, if we are able to give a percentage back to the farmer, so how does this help the system? Initially, I go to a farmer or a VLE and I tell them that I need your biomass waste, which is zero value, but I still give them some money that time to offtake that particular commodity, which is a waste. I take it to the industry and make a commodity, which is the end product or the byproduct in between. And I earn a lot of money. And if I give back a portion of that money back to the initial person on earth who sowed that particular crop and had that waste for me, I think he will become a lifelong stakeholder in this journey. Ahead. This is just a snapshot of what the 4P model means. This is, there is much more to that model in terms of policy initiation and, and otherwise. And I'm quite sanguine that today India is at a cusp of being at a leader in the energy transition. And while we are looking at all the gamuts of energy, whether it's electric vehicles or green hydrogen or otherwise, biofuels, SAF, uh, the key component in this particular you know, energy transition in the future, apart from the you know, sun's rays coming down and the winds blowing and the water flowing, would be how much of biomass is picked up because not only has it got connotation for uh, energy transition in a very big way, it is going to make our country truly Bharat and strike towards the dream of Anadata se Urja Data. And I think uh, that is the new beginning which India is looking at. And towards the next zero 2070, we will be a formidable force if we are able to just streamline and reduce the risk in the supply chain management of the biomass in our country, and that be sufficient. So I think I will put a pause there, Mr. Rao, and I would take on some questions or suggestions from you and the audience so that we can take this forward, please. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rohit. Excellent. I know this uh, fast uh, uh, summary of uh, things, what you're doing, and uh, really uh, great to know uh, the what you guys are doing and I'm very much thankful to Mr. Monish to come forward you know, and make a presentation of course he was unable to join but um, thank you Mr. Monish and uh, uh, Rohit it's, it's a really great presentation I want to touch a couple of points here I see some oh. feedback here um, um, guys you know, they're saying that they want to set up this plant in their their uh, state in UP okay they want to reach out to you I will share the, their contact and uh, you know you can, you can take it forward. It will be a pleasure. Yeah. In fact, just to reiterate, uh, in this uh, financial year coming, UP is one of the key states uh, where we'll be taking business in any which case. So it would be a great opportunity to do that. Yeah. And also there is one person is saying they are also interested in Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure whether they have an opportunity in Saudi Arabia too. Okay. There is a no problem. There. We can always have a conversation. We can always draw synergies. Uh, we actually are looking at uh, a couple of uh, countries in, in Africa today. And uh, we did have a, a dream around the Middle East uh, to see how to go ahead. But if there is somebody who's you know willing to make a beginning in that country, we'll be happy to support the mission as well. So fantastic, and I really like them because I'm a son of a farmer. Okay, I'm a proud son of a right. farmer, and I'm happy to see that you're saying the word farmer entrepreneur. 
Okay. Uh, um, can you talk about yes. uh, how successful it is and, um, you know, how many right. uh, former we call, actually, I used to work with a former tripper, you know, kind of blend the words former and right. entrepreneur together. Yeah. So, um, right. how, how... So, so, so these village level entrepreneurs or farmers, as we call them, uh, it's been a transition, Mr. Rao. So let me give an example of Punjab. When a company stepped in there in the, in, in the early uh, of this decade, last decade, uh, we had to go there and create the awareness that, right, this is a waste, please give it to us. We'll give you the expertise in terms of manpower and the machines and we'll draw it out. And after drawing it out, we'll also give you some money. So yeah. awareness campaign started and, and Prespel did the whole haul. We had the investment of uh, machines and manpower and time and resources to extract that waste from the fields and take it to our collection centers. As the couple of seasons only progress, I think the first only, so farmer grew wise. He says, I also have a tractor. So if I bring it to you, will you give me more money? He said, yes. <laughs> then the farmer was also intrigued because the government said have a subsidy for you know balers and rakers and cutters that time. So farmer said, if I draw down that, so the government will give me a 50% of the rate. So if I get my own machine and I only take your expertise and I get it to your storage area, will you give me more money? He said, yes. And then slowly and surely the farmer said, I don't need you. I'll come and give you at the center. Give me my money. So that is the way, you know, in, 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 a, in a very layman's term, I've described to you how the transition does take place. I show you a photograph that was of Karnataka, a place called Haveri. And when I went there initially, it had nothing. There was not even the concept of the, you know, ways to be picked up. And today we are running successfully a hundred tons plant, which is, you know, looking after deck and fine chemicals limited in Goa. We not only supply the brickets from Haveri in Karnataka to Goa, we also do the OM of this plant of DFCL. But today, that same farmer, I'll show you a picture, right? He, in one year's interaction with us, one year, one full season and one half season, bought two tractors and a small, uh, you know, car, not a sedan, but a small car. So that is the way the rural economy can shape up. And our country's interest beyond everything else, and I personally believe in this because, you know, a lot of us, me, Monish, incidentally, my company is very unique. There are five of us. So Munish at the top, that's me. We have our key technical officer, Kanu Manan, who's a gallantry award winner, Sena Medal there. And we have Commander Seko from the Indian Navy and Colonel Sandeep Singh. Five of us go back 31 years. We went and stepped as boys into the National Defense Academy in the same year in 1991, went to the same squadron and the same course. So you can understand what kind of born homie we have. We also have Colonel Pranab Roy, again, a military veteran at the top in the East Zone today. And in all segments of our management of the supply chain particular, I make it a point to either hire a lot of uh, you know, ex-military people or a lot of young farmers. Because I believe ex-military is because of the reach they bring to us and the kind of interaction and the humanness they bring and the purpose they bring. So the, the people are a little more assuaged when they approach them. And the young farmers, because you also understand that, no, I'm not too sure about the other parts of globe completely, but in India, People want to go to cities. People want to go to Canada, leaving their you know, farm behind for some other uh, tiling community to come and tile. So we don't want that change to happen. We want farmers to be in the farmland. We want the rural community to grow better with amenities and facilities, but not migrate to a metropolitan city today. So that's also a challenge for both the country and the government of the day. And I think this concept of, you know, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, which Lal Bahadur said long time back, so we are generally there, the six of us on the top and many more in this company. We have done our Jai Jawan days. Now we are in our Jai, Jai Kisan days. So we are still young and you know, trying to attune. But to, just to answer your question very briefly, anywhere where you go with purpose and your intent is clear, and yes, the farmer does get the money, it is good. It happened in Punjab, you remember? Three, four years back, fines for a stubble burning. So the farmer was trying to tell people like us that come and you know take the waste from my field and for every acre i will give you 350 rupees or 500 rupees lot many you know uh, people took that opportunity and curated their business models around that we never did that as an ethical concept monish and me decided that we will not do that we will still give the money and that has you know stood us in good stead we still have our vles we are growing by numbers we are enhancing our business in the last three years i've been in this company we have had a 15x growth in the next five years, probably with the projects which we are trying to look at, it's a 14x. Numbers in terms of X looks very lucrative, a small company, small revenue, 
but that's the way to go today small small steps will take us a little more ahead so we are happy to be with the farmers and we are happy to make sure that you know uh, we uh, have the ethical and the proprietal you know sensibility to make sure that they are carried along with us that's why i, i have created a triple four, you know, the 4p model because nobody cons is concerned about them triple p everybody makes everybody knows irr everybody knows ebitda everybody knows gross margin and my thing is you know gross margin can be 5% but as long as i'm giving 2% more to the farmer i think i'm doing a little more humane work on this earth yeah. yeah it's really good to see that you know that grassroots development which you call it you know the village you know the, the countryside development really uh, i always see that you know in the villages also you have do you guys work as a, you know farmers groups as as individually farmer or farmer groups both, both. so what we do is we go uh, for awareness to a set of villages pick up pick up these young farmers and young people with a little bit of intellect and you know the way to handle things around and they are our village level entrepreneurs who then head on to the villages again and they go and deep dive with their mamas chachas bhanjas and everybody else and sell the concept once the concept is sold initially then we go on ground and create these systems and ecosystems and as part of risk mitigation we started last uh, last year we started to sign up with the farmers to say you give me and i will give you the money on a by and by basis but you will appreciate it doesn't work with all 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 locations because farmers are very very you know uh, concerned and scared when you tell them to sign up something so we are simplifying those sheets we are saying okay here you are writing how much you will give and here is the money so leave the legalities but as long as social norms no child labor and other things are taken care of we are good to work with and you do your company based you know the name it shows is panja of course um, agriculture is the key uh -huh. yeah and that's, that's how, much, how much how much how uh, much um uh, um a business in punjab is it punjab or is am am understood no, no, correctly not at all, not at all. Okay. the name is punjab because uh, money started there so okay. when he when he left his military uniform and he took a premature he didn't complete 20 years as well so his okay. uncle opened the first biomass based paddy straw based power plant in the country he imported mm -hmm. a lot of uh, machines from japan that time and he was the manager monish and monish incidentally has done you know the, the the nuclear physics course in bark as well before he was taken out so nuclear okay. physics so to say came to uh, the uh, you know electricity part of the renewable energy and today is running a supply chain company and 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 and, and i think uh, there is just no problem uh, in the way we are looking at things today and we will be able to shape this up much much better and as for the presence is concerned it's actually pan india today going to the 14 state as i speak today so business expanding and and our, and our and our shareholders are giving us a lot of advantage i just give you one example of mitsui india mitsui actually you know has invested in us so the indian component of mitsui they have three regional segments in india and they are through their affiliates getting a lot of business and also synergies to develop each other's business as well so that is how a company grows so we primarily are looking at how our growth happens in the supply chain bandwidth and then to be able to support a mitsui a shell or any other global omc or any other private sector in the compressed biogas biofuel sf those are the major ones today we derive a lot of revenue like you asked and survive basically on the projects which which we have laid onm of boilers it's a temporary phase but the moment the first ethanol comes moment a few cbg come moment the sf takes the you know turn it's supposed to take we primarily will scale up in the supply chain segment only In a, in a much bigger way and all the shareholders and others will be the contributors for the projects that's the way i look at it but yes punjab is a misnomer a lot of people have told me to change names i go to maharashtra they say marathi manus what punjab name all that happens <laughs> right but uh, yeah. but since we are military so our military people go and tell them in the language they understand people do understand so it happens it helps us well. <laughs> so among india which states really produce a major you know biomass particularly talk about rice first you know uh, which is a major right, so, um, So see, we 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 are not looking at uh, the country from the paddy straw part. Like I told mm -hmm. you, we are looking at cane, we are looking at soya bean, yeah. we are looking at maize, we are looking at many things. So say if I go to east, I'll just give you example of the three sectors. East, I would like to develop corn as a big business, corn-based waste. Corn produces excellent briquettes and pellets. Too much of industry to grow from. Corn is a very good silage element for the cattle feed. right and corn pellets can also be used for tea states for withering process so imagine i can use the same corn for industrial use electricity heating cooling you know you want to have uh, steam contracts i can do silage for the cows i can do the withering process 
so we are looking at a particular commodity where we can you know sort of curate many more things around it so that becomes a little balanced you know investment from our side to run that project as well but uh, name the name the waste and we'll take it so lentil veneer waste woody based you know you have to name the waste to me coconut prawn coffee has you know even d oil cake of cashew nut everything is up for grabs in in, in the domain of bi bioenergy and among this you know renewable energies let's look at the wind okay so wind is it's compared to solar i think wind is a bit slow compared you know because of various issues uh, i think the how is the government support when they give support okay bioma you know renewable energy the plan is renewable energy but when you divide into the solar so into biomass you know uh, and so how is support on the government how is the competition or growth among each other so so right when you compared the solar and the wind right wind suzlon came long time back into the military areas of jaisalmer and beyond towards the border right? they had a problem now and the problem was because they did mitigate the most important risk the risk of the land lease right it was not a government lease land lease of 99 years and that right? it was through people and then people wanted more money and, and things had a standstill but in so far as biomass is concerned it has been a journey of slow awakening for you know our country we had biomass in 2012 13 you must have heard of lot of biogas topics and subsidies and it crashed it primarily crashed because you know the system was such that people drew a lot of money project inflation cost pegged at 100 crores was was not even 40 crores drew down 50 percent of the bank and never run never ran the project right and then everybody said lack of biomass so not only was the project ill planned and in most cases there were hoodwinkers in the system who did it they also got a bad name to the supply chain part to say biomass is not available today there are reports of every segment whether it's a tifac report or a mnr report and we also do a lot of biomass assessment study for even state governments and key omcs on the global standard today as a company and we know how we do it and we are very sure of the biomass availability so when when you see this the only two or three interjection or interventions from the government was in the policy i'll give you an example how positive the government is i was in september in an open forum like this trying to tell the honorable minister shri rk singh who is both power and mnr what should be done and his concern was ntpc i said ntpc one tender two tender i told at the first tender to your chairman there that you must have a longer tenure four years no private entity is financially viable to go to a bank and get even a loan to raise money right nobody did it he listened and the next week or 10 days it was in the in the in the notification that the government of the day then we said you know he made 7 and 8 years he asked me rohit how much should it be i said ideally 10 years but uh, you know if you have to make a mix and match 7 to 8 years he made it then i said why don't you enforce the use in industrial you know segment enforce just the same letter and did it to then we told him that why don't you do a biomass based solar biomass hybrid ipp try it because solar of start from 16 rupees and it's come to 2 rupees something right today try it. so that is the way the product is is today you imagine uh, mr rao every policy of the government especially when you saw the national electricity policy being you know uh, have a relook re or refine or any other thing even drone you talk of anything it's on social media you can go on linkedin take it off give your comments and somebody will probably see it also so that is the first you know uh, indicator of change in the country that when we say we want the re transition we actually mean that business when i came i was having a you know bloody mary with uh, monish when i was not even joined him and i was sitting with him and i wanted to see what industry is and he was telling me amdabad to mumbai there will be a bullet train i said yes that reminds me bullet train japan is giving a you know loan at 1% interest why can't we get 1% for this segment and he laughed he says you are you know not even in the corporate segment nobody will give it 1% i said let's give it a try and he says you know you have a bloody mary and try so i typed and he looked and we sent some paper to the you know concerned people in red and beyond today it's at a stage where probably it will come through yes not at 1% but at 4 to 5% maybe so i think you know uh, you know at times there are ideas which need to germinate and i think the time of this idea to make a energy transition in which bioenergy is a substantial subset i think the time has come and that is why the government is very 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 proactive in fact the mos of this ministry mr kuba he doesn't look much after the electricity part he looks after primarily the bio bioenergy part so that is the kind of weight is there and i think the government is positively inclined there is a meeting on 7th as we speak day after 
they've been invited us again as Prespel. So I think we are we are doing good, and and the country is doing good. And I take a lot of heart from what we are doing actually. Mr. Rohit, I'd like to continue the discussion, but I still have a little time. So I thank you for joining. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, uh, Jai Hind Sab, Jai Hind Sab. Thank you. And it, it's my first time having a uh, guest in my you know 20 years of uh, organizing various programs from Army. I'm really right. glad that I know you. And it's it's to be on some forum and we'll be talking technology as a as a heading. So I'm also very you know excited about it. So hope to see you sometime, probably in Thailand. Sure. See you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thanks, Arif. Right. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. That's about the you know the renewable energy. Um, let's uh, let me take over. It's an interesting discussion with Mr. Rohit Dev, uh, the renewable energy, sustainable biomass supply chain and energy. Uh, let's move on to the. Uh, Next session. Uh, before I invite our next speaker, uh, quickly introduce about our training programs on the process technology online education. Uh, let me show you the uh, short presentation on it. That's about the process technology online education. Uh, if you're interested in any of these topics, you can check the details at the uh, knowhow-webinars.com. Okay, let's move to the last part of uh, this episode, Environment Technology News Server. Uh, this is about author talk. And we have an author who, who wrote a book on the wastewater treatment technology, design consideration. Uh, there is a Dr. Mutin Jai Chaubay. He is a global vice president, environment, sustainability, and green cell at UPL Limited. Let me brief you about Dr. Mutin Jai. Uh, he is a sustainability, environmental, and water and wastewater treatment expert of international reputation. He has done his PhD in environmental engineering from IIT Delhi. He has uh, nearly 24 years' experience in various MNCs, Pentair, Shell, Unilever, and UPL. He has made a unique position in, in corporate world by embedding the sustainability and reducing environment footprint of big corporations such as the Pentair, Shell, Unilever and uh, currently uh, more than 100 in environment production sustainable technology are successfully working in Europe and Asia, Africa, North America and South America designed by him. Dr. Chaube is also an editorial board member of renowned international journal, a research journal of chemistry and environment, as well as Arab Water World. He is also the member of Bureau of Indian Standards for making the BIS standards for water and wastewater treatment and environmental protection. And more than 50 technical papers have been published in renowned international journals and conferences. He is author of a renowned book, that's what we are talking about today, is the Wastewater Treatment Technologies, a Design Consideration, and published by the Wiley, based in USA. 
He is currently working as, as I mentioned to you, Global Vice President for the Environment, Sustainability and Green Cell uh, with the UPL. And recently, he's been awarded with the Most Influential Sustainability Leader Award, and also Chief Sustainability Officer of the Year Award and Asian Sustainable Leadership Award. So we have a well-experienced water and wastewater treatment expert with expensive good credentials and having as a part of this program today. Uh, Dr. Mithunjai, welcome. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening and uh, good morning to your viewer from other part of the world. Yes. I'm really excited to have you. You know, I we pers I personally publish uh, books. So when somebody writes a books, it's a noble thing. You know, you are con you know you're you're sharing the knowledge through the books, your experience. You working as an ex, you know, you are not a professor. You are actually a practitioner, and writing a book, it's a really you know very useful. I personally felt that you know having you is a uh, it's a it's a good for the industry, good for the engineers. So let's uh, let's get to know more about your adventure of writing a book, okay? And uh, how you enjoyed it. And you know, I think it's once is over. Oh man, it's over. Writing a book is not easy. You know, a lot of people. Yeah, it's just only hundred. It's at a two hundred. It's a three hundred. It's a lot of work is there. Is it right? Yeah. How, right. how much time you take write the book? Yeah. So I, I think it took a lot of time and uh, uh, when this is pandemic came and the lockdown happened, so that enabled me and uh, given us some time to write this book. I was thinking from long time to write this because if in last uh, 25 years, uh, my career, professional career with various industries and also Six year I was in the research work at IIT Delhi. So I I was interested to summarize my 30 year of experience in wastewater treatment. So you will find several practical aspects in this book, but it was not possible earlier because uh, you are right, a lot of time is needed. Uh, and uh, when the lockdown happened, then it's enable some time I got and then we written this book. Yeah, and as I know, it's also important to have a good editor, particularly Wiley as a, you know, one of the best publishers, you know, uh, working with a good editor and it will help you fast track or minimize the time losses. Is it right? Yeah, so you have a good yeah. editor working with you from Wiley, yeah? yeah because they are the professional publisher and more than 100 years of experience. So yes, they enable us in writing this uh, in a very well organized way. So why do you choose, okay, wastewater treatment technology, because a lot of things to talk about, but you talk about highlight and design consideration. Why only design? So I think first let me show the book. I think yeah. uh, uh, this okay. is the, uh, I think, uh, is it coming? Yes, yes, it is, it is. Okay, super. Yeah. It's a hardbound book, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. I think I think yeah. Yes, yes. So coming to your question, uh, design, uh, uh, why design consideration? Uh, because when we see the wastewater treatment, then design is very important. Yeah. And uh, especially uh, if you go in the conventional book, then you may get uh, design aspect about the conventional technologies like activated sludge process and, and many more technology. But uh, the design aspect of latest advanced technologies, that is missing. So I have included several advanced and the latest technology and, and that design methodology has been included in this book. Yeah, we used to have like a wastewater engineering. There's a very thick book, you know, the, yeah. is it Macup Smith, is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's when we design, you know, so it's, we use all those old, I, I don't know how current, how the situation, you know, but uh, that was a basic reference when you talk about the activated sludge systems and things like that. Yeah. So, so you, this book, um, what you wrote, 
you nicely mentioned that you uh, not only the old information but also up to date on the design consideration so it, is it aimed for the uh, young people or it's also aimed for the practitioners in the business currently that is right so i think here our aim of writing this book and the content which uh, i have summarized in this keeping uh, uh, this young professional also uh, mainly practitioner uh, uh, who is in the industry or coming in industry so well uh, designed uh, uh, methodology has been uh, summarized in this book and uh, you will find the beauty in this book is this that uh, i have uh, taken the help of table so no need to write more and more pages uh, very few pages you will get the exact uh, design methodology design formula so our aim was for the practitioner and also for those industry professionals who don't have much more background um, earlier but if they can read this book then they can also design very well the wastewater treatment plant a part of this our aim is also uh, for the operators so last chapter is devoted for the operation of wastewater treatment plant and how operational excellence play the important role um, in treating the wastewater that has been also included uh, in this book so so i suggest everybody whether you are young or new entrant to the wastewater treatment or you already practitioner or extensive experience it is a good reference for them you know and uh, yeah. and so you 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 know wastewater you have two types right one is on industrial other one is a municipal right so in this book are you balancing a both or which which case studies you are compile because industrial wastewater the variations are different the concentration levels are different compared to the municipal wastewater and also municipal wastewater city to city it depends on the population you know the changes so uh, is it relevant for both industry both type of wastewater yeah, what it is like so uh, this is relevant for both uh, municipal wastewater treatment as well as industrial wastewater treatment but mm -hmm. um, uh, as you know um, industrial wastewater treatment is a very complex because yeah. several kind of uh, streams comes from the several industry and uh, every industry have a unique characteristics of wastewater and also different methodology and different design approach is needed for the different industry to design the wastewater so in this book um, you you can design the municipal wastewater also uh, but uh, we have focused more toward the industrial wastewater Okay. and uh, normally if you go through this book then uh, i have considered nearly 30 kind of industry so okay. 30 industries uh, wastewater has been summarized uh, in this book so you can go very easily the characteristics of those industry so whether it is the uh, oil uh, industry or it is the fmcg or it is aluminium manufacturing a smelter plant or dairy so tannery uh, paper and pulp so like that uh, 30 kind of industry where practically i have got uh, the characteristics and also i involve in the designing of uh, wastewater in those industry so all those practical and the exact data has been mm. summarized and very easily people can get the characteristics of those industry from this book and then the different design methodology and the design considerations have been summarized in this book fantastic really it's really useful if you have that kind of uh, information there i think if anybody is a consultant or a designer they find it really useful yeah. In your profile, I understand that you work with the uh, MNCs, right? You work with Unilever, you work with Pentair, Shell. Um, 
so can you talk a little briefly about are you, are you in the book also probably your experience what are the best practices implemented or best designs and is it helped you in uh, those uh, extensive 20 plus years experience in those multinationals you know so i think uh, uh, first uh, i started uh, my career in wastewater treatment with uh, when i was doing doctorate at iit delhi and uh, iit delhi used to provide the consultancy to industry and there i got chance to go through the different problem of different industry in the wastewater and uh, there uh, we used to go in industry try to see the wastewater treatment issues and then uh, we work on the design and provide the solution. So I think there I got chance to interact with various industry. Then I started my career with the Pentair Water. So Pentair uh, is a US multinational company and they provide the technical solution to various industry. So there I was part of their technical support team and uh, our work was to provide the technical support to various industry uh, in implementation of uh, wastewater solution which Pentair used to provide. So there also I got opportunity to go in the field, interact uh, with the various uh, people, see the various issues and then design the wastewater treatment and uh, actually uh, do the installation and the commissioning work mm -hmm. and uh, after Pentair I moved to Cell so I was part of Cell Global Solution at Netherlands and um, mm -hmm. our role was provide technical solution to entire uh, Cell group so they have various refinery and also uh, upper stream business where oil exploration took place and also they have a, a, a business in the gas, power. So we, we got a lot of chance in several country. I got chance to visit and uh, see the wastewater treatment issues of uh, cell and, and then provide the solution. So from there, uh, we, we got uh, several learning and that has been summarized in this book. Uh, after sale, uh, I came in Unilever and uh, in Unilever, uh, we were looking nearly 500 factories globally and uh, they have a, a several, seven, eight category kind of business. So they have ice cream factory, they have personal care factory, they have home care factory, savory. So a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, industries are there in Unilever and I got uh, opportunity to visit all those plants and then I came across all the characteristics, design methodology and we provided the solution. So those things has been also summarized in this book. Uh, right now from last six years uh, I am a global vice president and head of uh, UPL for the environment, sustainability, and also green cell. So at UPL also, we have nearly 43 manufacturing plant globally. And here also, we got a lot of issue because we are manufacturing agrochemicals. So we got a lot of complex issue of wastewater in our various plant. So here also, uh, I, I got chance to design and also go through the characteristics, see the issue, more toward the operational issue because uh, you can design wastewater treatment plant, you can install the very good wastewater treatment plant, but operation also play key role in the success of wastewater treatment. So I think operational excellence that has been summarized in this book. But I think uh, to summarize all these experience, uh, uh, one thing I got uh, learning in the wastewater treatment that uh, effluent characterization, segregation is very important for the wastewater treatment. Because when you will go in any industry, 
then you will find several kind of uh, uh, streams comes and if you feel that let collect all the waste water at one place and one technology or one process will provide the solution then i i don't think uh, for a bigger kind of complex it it, it will succeed so normally um, my learning and also i have summarized in this book is this that uh, affluent identification then characterization and then segregation so that is very important for the success of wastewater treatment so it's very nice that you got hands on experience you know the issues and that made it easy you know so you know, in your book, you have one of the topic uh, chapter is sustainable wastewater management. Can you talk elaborate on what is sustainable wastewater management? Here? Right. So, uh, sustainable wastewater management means uh, a kind of wastewater management where you can achieve uh, the treatment efficiency, desired treatment efficiency, at minimum use of energy minimum uh, waste generation uh, in form of sludge and minimum uh, requirement of manpower because uh, if we want to make it sustainable then we should must focus that our wastewater treatment doesn't consume much more energy because if, again if we are consuming more energy then more, more carbon emission will be there so okay. sustainable wastewater treatment means we have to focus on energy efficiency also yeah. we have to focus on the sludge waste which is getting generated from the primary and secondary clarifier and that can be minimized if we minimize the chemical use so yeah. the chemical consumption should be also less for a sustainable wastewater treatment and the third is the manpower and the area occupancy should be very less because today in our industry the it, this is biggest challenge that we don't have much more any area and we cannot design like a, a past conventional treatment plant where a big aeration tank you can design so now nobody have so much area and uh, the industry have to focus on their manufacturing and the process area they don't have so much a spare a space so the system should be compact less area occupied so i think those aspects have been included in sustainable wastewater management and uh, uh, in this book um, i have summarized some of the technologies like uh, if you see the forward osmosis technology then that is very compact technology to treat if you see solar detoxification technology that is also very compact technology to treat if you see volute that has been mentioned in this book so that is a very compact sludge dewatering device so uh, my effort in this book is to focus on sustainable technology where it can deliver the desired result with minimum energy consumption minimum carbon emission minimum waste generation and minimum manpower requirement minimum area occupancy requirement I think the MBR also has playing a role. I think the compact systems and are more for, uh, you know, when compared to the other, what is what is your opinion about MBR and uh, any of your plants are using MBRs in uh, treating the wastewater? So, yes, MBR um, is also very good and uh, in two, two of our unit is using right now. Uh, um, but the problem with MBR is that here we use a membrane based yeah. technology and the membrane get submerged inside the aeration tank. So yeah. uh, sometimes falling of membrane happens to be issue. Also, if you have uh, uh, some toxic element, heavy metals, then also uh, it creates problem for the MBR. What we have found that uh, in place of MBR, MBBR, uh, uh, that offers a very good solution uh, in the wastewater treatment. 
and now we have implemented many more mbbr plant as compared to mbr plant yeah that's correct that's mbbr it is cost effective also mbbr and under these advanced sustainable technologies also lead to the zero discharge right you know this when you're using this technology so what is your experience with this zero discharge i think you also highlighted that uh, uh, zero discharge in, in in your book i think the many industries would be interested to know see the word zero discharge yes very nice to hear but uh, when it comes to the implementation when it comes to design the system you because of the limitations or various waste characteristics and this what is your experience on the zero discharge what can what your information covered in the in your book so i think many more uh, uh, zld zero liquid discharge uh, uh, i have get chance to implement it and mm -hmm. i think at this moment if you see our upl then 60% of our operating plants are zero liquid discharge. Oh, okay. So uh, the concept of establishment of a zero liquid discharge is very good. But what issue is that it cannot be generalized and made compulsory everywhere. Yeah. Because the main issue with JDLD is uh, it consume more energy, uh, it consume more chemical, it generate more uh, hazardous waste and also it's occupy more area. So uh, what uh, my experience uh, with JDLD is that in those area where there is a no proper treated wastewater discharge facility available and also very water scarce location, then yes, JDLD is good and we can implement it. But in those area where you have a common effluent treatment plant or you have a deep sea discharge facility available and you can treat your wastewater and you can discharge at suitable place, then I don't think in those kind of situation making mandatory JDLD is a good move. And why it's not good move? Because if you want to achieve just a standard for the discharge uh, so whatever the discharge norm is there if you want to achieve that norm and if you design that kind of etp and as compared to this zld etp you will find carbon emission will be four times more with the zld uh, etp than uh, normal just to achieve the discharge standard chemical consumption is two times more so sludge generation happens to be two times more in jdld also operating cost will be nearly three times more capex will be 2.5 times more so i think unless until uh, it, it's very required uh, i i think we should just design those kind of wastewater treatment plant who can meet the uh, discharge standard and and then we can dispose suitably with treated wastewater. Yeah, interesting that. You know, the you talk one other technology, I wonder, you know, solar detoxification. What is a detoxification? Any is a panel that you just use in the evaporation? What it is? Uh, no, it, it's not evaporation. Uh, solar detoxification is a kind of a new technology, and I think it was my part of a PhD thesis also. In, oh, in okay. IIT and um, we have implemented this in industry the main aim of solar detoxification is this technology work when conventional biological treatment failed to work means okay. those kind of effluent where you will get more TDS more than 10,000 ppm TDS then uh, it, it cannot be treated with the conventional biological treatment then uh, this solar detoxification is very good technology and in this technology what we uh, uh, do we use the solar power and uh, in, in solar radiation you will get a uv radiation and when that uv radiation from the solar get a strike with the uh, a special made catalyst uh, mainly 
titanium dioxide made catalyst we used to make a reactor and when the uv radiation a strike with the titanium oxide reactor then a very powerful hydroxy radicals get formed inside the oh. reactor and that hydroxy radicals is powerful oxidizer and it will able to reduce the bod and the cod concentration inside the effluent uh, irrespective of tds whatever the tds inside the effluent is there uh, you can use this technology and you can reduce the organic impurities from the wastewater also the benefit of this technology is that since it is powerful oxidizer also it is a powerful disinfectant okay. so the uh, organic impurities also get removed biological impurities also get removed and if heavy metals are there that also get oxidized and removed so in one reactor you you able to reduce uh, organic impurities which can be measured in form of bod cod you can also reduce the biological impurities and you can also reduce the heavy metal also mm -hmm. it is a uh, it is also decolorize the effluent if some color available inside the effluent then it also reduce the color inside the wastewater treatment so so why this is a very useful technology but yes the cost wise it is a slightly higher cost than the normal available activated sludge process so we used to recommend only in those cases where biological wastewater treatment doesn't work uh, th then we can use uh, this solar detoxification so are there people are using this technology other than you you feel anybody else in india or in or any of your clients i i think uh, four or five places uh, people are using and uh, and mainly uh, uh, those chemical complex where the high tds comes so they mm. are using but yes you will not find many more places it's mm. not so popular but but mm. now it's catching up slowly and slowly so you know i, I want to touch a little bit on the design and back to the designers okay because you know i know i've seen that some plants got failed because of bad design okay and over design under design wrong designs okay and uh, in your in your experience probably you have met many designers definitely okay with uh, and uh, uh, what is your opinion about um, common pitfalls of the designers so i think uh, uh, my experience is that uh, you are right design is very important but uh, most important is the uh, the assumption which has been made during design and in wastewater treatment the all basis of wastewater treatment design lie on the characteristics of the wastewater yes. and unless until you get the right characteristics like what is ph what is cod what is bod what is tds what is tss what is oil and grease means uh, there are nearly 15 16 characteristics in in any wastewater treatment plant especially in industrial effluent treatment plant uh, we should must uh, get those near to perfect range and uh, um, uh, this book which i have written in uh, chapter second I have devoted entire chapter for that one. and mm -hmm. nearly 30 kind of industry exact inlet effluent characteristics has been summarized in this book and that is a very important for the designer once they get the exact characteristics then I think 50% is over now rest is to select the suitable technology and also a suitable design methodology so for that uh, i have summarized uh, in a tabulated form design methodology that uh, 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 how will be the design consideration for those wastewater treatment and i think uh, this book will be very helpful for the designer uh, a part of this 
another uh, things uh, which i told you uh, a stream identification characterization and segregation that is also very important for the designer and here in this book i have devoted one chapter where it has been well illustrated that uh, uh, how you can do the wastewater a stream identification then characterization and then segregation and uh, uh, i have uh, summarized three kind of a stream mainly and and that found in any kind of industry one is the green stream second is yellow stream and third is red stream so green stream means all those effluent which tds is below 5000 ppm and cod below 10000 ppm so you just make one green stream and for green stream you can apply the simple biological treatment like diapam bbr or activated sludge process then lo stream lo stream is those stream where tds is higher than 5000 ppm but below uh, 100000 ppm and uh, cod in range of uh, more than 10000 ppm but below 20000 ppm so those all get uh, at one place and you can apply some suitable technology in this book i have recommended forward osmosis uh, oh radical solar detoxification so those kind of technology can be applied and the third stream is red stream so in red stream tds which is higher than 100000 ppm and cod higher than 20000 ppm it's very difficult to treat with the uh, conventional methodology so they are we segregate it and and then we may treat with the multi effective evaporators or catalytic wet air oxidation process so i think uh, these uh, a stream identification characterization segregation is very important for the design and also is important how much money in your pocket which 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 pro which uh, you know uh, technology even there are a lot of good technologies there Uh, at the end of the day, all the pollution control, they look at the you know end of the pipe. You still, you know, they they're not really concerned unless there is a okay. Nowadays you have because of the biological uh, process, you have waste to energy. You can recover biogas in an anaerobic style. You know, but I think still the challenge is also the economics. Economics makes a difference. You know, the technologies are available. It's a matter of the economics and also the operational skills, the level of understanding of the, you know, that also in the past, you know, people just to dig the pond, you know, thousands or thousands of, you know, square meters and put the water over there. And so, you know, in, uh, you talked about, um, you know, important things like characteristics which is a key at the same time you also is important the volumes i think same whether it's air pollution or even the solid waste or even the water waste and waste water volumes and its variations you know uh, that really uh, you know you design because the industry process keep on changing there is no consistency in the, and also the level of water consumption it varies also worker to worker shift to shift as well as i understand you know i I've, i've seen places in food industry uh, you, you don't see the you know uh, the you can hear me right yeah yes yes uh, i'm okay. hearing yeah so it, it's it's um no how to say uh, variation changes so it's important to it's important that people have to look at the variations of the volumes of quantity you know so yeah right so, uh, so, so i think uh, variation in volume also play important role and normally when we design the wastewater treatment plant then we consider uh, variation uh, Uh, approximate uh, 15 to 20%. So, if uh, there will be variation of uh, uh, 15 to 20%, then yes, um, the uh, existing effluent treatment plant take care. But um, uh, you are right. If if there will be more variation than that, then it pose problem uh, at the treatment process. Hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, you know, I don't want to touch the last topic on this one is the software. Are there any suggestions on the software to use uh, you know, designing the wastewater treatment? What is your recommendations? So software uh, enable us uh, to make it a perfect design. And uh, I think at this moment we are using one software uh, of the DHI, one, uh, one Netherlands company and they provide uh, one DHI software. So that software we use for the design as well as also we use for performance optimization of uh, existing ATP. So I hmm. think uh, uh, more than design, uh, nowadays softwares are very helpful in yeah. optimizing the performance of ATP. And, and hmm. you know, when the characteristics of wastewater go on changing, then if you can use a smart technology uh, with the software, then it sends the inlet characteristics and then the dosing uh, at the primary treatment get automatically adjusted aeration quantity get automatically adjusted and uh, i see a great role in the operation and maintenance of uh, etp uh, as far as softwares are concerned well uh, thank you very much uh, dr mutinja it's really nice talking to you and you know and uh, you gave us a lot of inputs on the design aspects at the same time why people should read your book um, and uh, keep writing more okay this is very important i always encourage people to write more books uh, so that uh, the next generation uh, and to have some you know resource uh, you know to use the right information you know people always yeah google it google it uh, but it's at the end of the day you need the filtered information good books are very useful Okay, you know, Google, it goes on the SEOs, you know, you can play with uh, how to get on the first uh, page. But I think the uh, quality uh, information is very important and the pe people like you should write more books and uh, can help the younger generation. So I thank you for joining this session today. Appreciate it. Um, okay, guys, if you like to have this book, uh, go to the, you know, wiley.com, right? Can you tell us how to get this book, um, Dr. Mutsinjai? I think at uh, uh, wiley.com also they can order and uh, also it is uh, available on almost all various e-commerce sites like uh, Amazon and uh, eBay and uh, many more sites. Uh, you, you can get it. Just uh, go in the Google search engine, write the name of this book, you, you, you will get it several e-sites from where it can be ordered. Also uh, from the uh, Wiley, it can be ordered. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Dr. Mutsunjai, for joining this session today. I mean, it's a very, really enjoyable talking to you and learn about your book and your knowledge, you know, experience uh, about the water and wastewater treatment technologies and uh, design. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, thank um, you. I want to thank you. I want to thank all the speakers today. And uh, if you want to reach out to them, you know, you can, um, you know, uh, you can uh, write an email to us, or you know, I will forward to them. Uh, I'm hoping that today's episode is useful to you. Um, this session, live session, it is available um, on YouTube and at the Technobi channel within a 24 hours, of, 24 hours of the live session like today, okay? Um, if you still if you still have questions after watching YouTube, you can also reach out to us, okay? You can also post your comments under our, on, on our, uh, under our video. Um, uh, we will, one of all the speakers will be connecting you sooner or later, okay? So thank you all. And um, if, you, if you need more assistance or anything, you know how to reach me, Okay, you can contact me or just contact my colleague. You know, she's also taking care of the secretary of the Environment Technology Network. You can write to her as well. Uh, I'm hoping to see you next week. See you next week on the uh, Environment and Technology News Hour. Thanks once again, all the speakers for joining the session today and contributing one on the air pollution, another one on the biomass, and the other one is on the wastewater treatment. I'm hoping that all of you find it useful. So once again, thank you very much.